Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. We have come this far by faith. All right, moderators. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let us now turn our faces toward the word of God found in the gospel of Jesus Christ according to Mark chapter 11 and we are going to read a few verses in your hearing and I think it will be an eye-opening experience this morning. Let us begin reading at verse number seven. Verse number seven, Mark chapter 11. And they brought the coat to Jesus and cast their garments on him. And he sat upon them. And many spread their garments in the way and others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way. And they that went before and they that followed cried saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the even, even tide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. Let us think for a subject this morning, when the cheering stopped. When the cheering stopped stopped friend of mine brother Blit Bear, Blair is the inspiration for this sermon but he he helps me think through this uh text because at some point uh people stop cheering for Jesus and it's one of the things that we see happening in our society that I want to whisper that the world's population is looking for fame and fortune but that's not why Jesus came so let us pray father I decrease that the Holy Spirit might increase speak through my vocal cords think through my mind all of you and none of me I declare that your word will flow freely uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic spirit. Father, your word is anointed. It shall not return to your board. It shall accomplish everything that you send it out to do. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. It is in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people say amen and amen. Some years ago, a book was written by a noted historian, American historian, entitled When the Cheering Stopped. It was the story of President Woodrow Wilson and the events leading up to and following World War I. When that war was over, Wilson was an international hero. There was a great spirit of optimism abroad and people actually believed that the last war had been fought and the world had been made safe for democracy. On his first visit to Paris after the war, Wilson was greeted by cheering mobs. He was actually more popular than their own heroes. The same thing was true in England and Italy. In a Vienna hospital, a Red Cross worker had to tell the children that there would be no Christmas presents because of the war and the hard times. The children didn't believe her. They said that President Wilson was coming and they knew that everything would be all right. The cheering lasted about a year. Then it gradually began to stop. 
It turned out that after the war, the political leaders in Europe were more concerned with their own agendas than they were a lasting peace. At home, Woodrow Wilson ran into opposition in the United States Senate and his League of Nations was not ratified. Under the strain of, all, of it all, the president's health began to break. He suffered a stroke and in the next election, his party was defeated. So it was that Woodrow Wilson, a man who barely a year earlier had been heralded as the new world messiah, came to the end of his days a broken and defeated man. It's a sad story, but one that is not that altogether unfamiliar. The ultimate reward for someone who tries to translate ideals into reality is apt to be frustration and defeat. There are some exceptions, of course, but not too many. And it happened that way to Jesus. When Jesus emerged on the public scene, he was an overnight sensation. He would try to go off to be alone and the people would still follow him. The masses lined the streets as he came into town. On Palm Sunday, leafly palm branches were spread before him and there were shouts of Hosanna. In shouting Hosanna, they were in effect saying, save us now, hear me? Save us now, Hosanna, the word means save us, save us now, not tomorrow, but save us now, not, not after the cross, but save us now, Jesus, deliver us from the Roman emperor and our bondage and oppression. Great crowds came to hear him preach. A wave of religious expectation swept the country. They expected Jesus to be that Messiah, prophesied to come and restore the kingdom of Israel, come and sit upon the throne of his father, David. And there Jesus was entering Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. They were cheering him. They were waving leafy branches at him. They were excited because they thought that here was the time of their deliverance. I wonder this morning, have we ever had a time when we expected that we were going to be delivered, that some miracle was about to occur only to find out that the time was not yet, only to find out that there was something afoot that had no semblance to a miracle but more resembled a mess. Ah. But that cheering of Jesus did not last long because when you don't meet people's needs, they stop cheering. There came a point when the tide began to turn against Jesus. You didn't notice it so much at first. People still came to see him, but that old excitement was missing. And the crowds were not as large as they had been. Some uh, Methodist preachers know that. They, they understand that because on their first Sunday at their new church, everybody shows up to meet the new preacher. But oh, about that second or third Sunday, uh, then you meet the real saints. You meet the committed saints. You meet those who were at the church not to meet the preacher, but to meet the master. Hallelujah. Preachers in the CME church can tell you exactly when the cheering stopped for them. Uh, I know I'm right there. He, he, Jesus' his critics began to publicly attack him. And that was something new. Earlier, the scribes, the priests, and Sadducees had been afraid to speak out for fear of the people. But they began to perceive that this fickle public was turning on him because he was not giving them their toys and whistles, because he was not trying 
to heal the sick or raise the dead. He was just waiting on his destiny. And so then the crowd stopped cheering. They began to snowball from loving him to hating him. When they discovered that they could not discredit him based on his moral character, they began to take more desperate measures, getting false witnesses against him and, and distorting his sermons and distorting uh, his messages to try to make the entire public turn against him. Before it was all over, a tidal wave welled up that brought Jesus to his knees under the weight of the cross. Why did the masses so radically turn against Jesus? How did the shouts of Hosanna on Sunday transform into the shouts of crucify him on Friday? I'm not just talking about the immediate events that may have brought it about, but, but the deeper root causes. What, what were the underlying issues in five days Jesus went from the shouts of Hosanna to the shouts of crucify him. That's what I want to look at for a few minutes. What are the root causes of why the cheering stopped? Well, one reason why the cheering stopped is that Jesus began to talk more and more about commitment. During the last week of Jesus's life, a very interesting scene occurred, and even more significantly, it occurred in full view of the people. A rich young ruler came enthusiastically running to Jesus. You, you're familiar with that dialogue that took place. You, you heard the rich young ruler ask Jesus, good master, uh, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said to him, go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. The masses were stunned. They were troubled first for a theological reason. They had been raised to believe that God had especially blessed rich men. Yet here is Jesus turning the big money away. I wonder how many churches would do that today. We, we think that people who are wealthy and prominent are individuals who need to be recruited and cultivated. We think their success in the world will lead to our success in the church. It bothered them, first of all, to see Jesus turn away a rich man because you know the Old Testament says that if you obey God, that you will eat the good of the land, that when you obey God, God will bless you. God will just knock your socks off. And so every Jew that they saw that was prosperous, they decided that that was a result of a blessing from God. They discounted the corruption that caused their riches. They were bothered also, though, for a second reason. Prior to this, Jesus' message had largely been one of grace. When the 5,000 were hungry, he fed them. When they brought their sick to him, he healed them. When a woman is caught in adultery and is about to be stoned, it is Jesus who comes to her rescue and saves her. This, this message of his ministry is one of grace upon grace. But now... He seems to be saying the time for miracles is over. The time for miracles is over. The time for miracles is over. How many of you know that one day there will be no miracles? One day you're going to have to endure suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And on this Passion week that we're about to embark upon. There are no miracles being performed by Jesus. No, Jesus is saying that the time for commitment is now. It's interesting to note that in all four gospels, after Jesus enters Jerusalem to the shouts of Hosanna 
and palm branches, there is not another miracle recorded. Oh, there are some events we might count as miracles, but no miracles that are done for the people. On the face of it, this may not seem significant, but when you consider that nearly one half of the gospels is devoted to the last seven days of Jesus's life, you then understand the significance. You can open your Bibles and see if this is true or not, but I guarantee you that there are no miracles being performed in the last seven days of Jesus's life, except when Peter cuts off uh, the man's ear and Jesus heals his ear. That's not a miracle. That's a necessity to reflect who Jesus is. He's not a violent man. He is a suffering servant. And so he can't have his disciples rising up, taking matters into their own hand, committing violent acts. That's a word for the day for somebody. Jesus says it is a time for commitment. And so while there are no miracles recorded in these chapters, you will find his persistent call to commitment. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Hungry one morning, Jesus stops by a fig tree and finds no figs. He, he withers the tree because it is producing no fruit. In other words, this symbolizes that Jesus is demanding fruitful committed lives a parable is told who is more committed jesus says the son who says i will work and then does not or the son who says i will not work repents and gets the work done <laughs> it is the son who does the work the greatest commandment is given during this week Love God and love your neighbor. Again, this is a call to commitment. His teachings be watchful, for we do not know the day nor the hour of his return is also in these seven days. It is after the triumphal entry everywhere. Jesus is looking. Jesus is asking for commitment and devotion from the people and what he heard in response he did not like. One of the great pulpiteers of Methodism tells a, of a story that occurred several years ago. He was on the campus of Nebraska Wesleyan talking to a group of students who had expressed an interest in the ministry. When asked how many of them were definitely committed to going into the parish ministry, only one raised their hand. One young lady spoke up and said, listen to this, uh, uh, I have a problem with your use of the word commitment. That sounds very binding and restricting. Listen to what Methodist Bishop Kenneth Carter of Tennessee wrote recently. He said, the church of today has become an institution in which even belief in God is optional or peripheral. Marketing techniques for a multiple option institution have replaced response to the gospel of Jesus Christ as a means of membership enlistment. The basic appeal is to self-defined needs rather than a call to radical discipleship. He says the church's mission all too often is to meet its members' perceived needs rather than to serve God's need for a redeemed, reconciled, and healed word, world. I find that striking because even as I'm running for election for bishop, we hear on this trail every interest group asking, what are you going to do for me? What are you going to do for the young adults? What specifically is in your platform for the Young adults, what are you going to do for the uh, single parents? What are you going to do for the local churches and the budget? What it, what's, for, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? What's in it for me if I, if I vote for you? It definitely sounds like a political campaign. 
Every time you have a Democrat or a Republican, what the people's questions have to do with, what's in it for us? What are you going to do for us? But Jesus is calling for commitment to what are you going to do for him and with him? He changes the, the table. He turns the table upside down in the temple, but he also turns the table upside down in our mind that we must begin to think what's in it for God rather than what's in it for me. Ah, I know I'm not going to get many shouts this morning, but you're on Zoom, so it's all right. Amen, amen, amen. What? what uh, our concept of consumerism has crept into the church. People won't join the church unless you have a nursery, unless you have flat screen technology, unless you have uh, Wi-Fi broadband streaming capability, unless you have options for giving that are simple and convenient for everyone. People are so now looking for convenience, they won't even put a stamp on an envelope and mail in their offering. They want it on Giblify, Text to Give, ATM, whatever. Just, just make it easy for me to give. But when you got giving easy, that means you got other things you want done easily. <laughs> now, we got all that at Lewis Temple, but I'm pointing out to you that this consumerism is not really feeding your spirit. Sometimes you got to feel your giving by actually going the extra mile and doing it in a way that is not convenient for you to do. That you actually have to fill out an envelope and put it in the mail and go by the post office or up to your mailbox. Just, just, just do something a little different. Drive to your neighbor's house who's an officer and give them your offering instead of always saying, won't you come by and pick it up? You have to make sure that what you're doing for Jesus is matters to you, is significant to you. Don't ever let it just be a matter of convenience. Jesus is looking for us to be committed. People in their advertisement says, look what our church can offer you. Come on over here. We don't, we're not as strict as a church down the street. We'll let you do what you want to do, how you want to do it. And you don't have to make any commitment because we love you. And because Jesus is preaching grace and the Bible is preaching grace. And we find when we ask people for commitment, they look at us just like this young lady looked at this professor at the Nebraska Wesleyan Institution. She said, I got a problem with the way you use the word commitment. And I dare say there are some people on this line and people are gonna hear this sermon who have a problem with the way the church uses the word commitment. I suggest to you that Jesus Christ says discipleship means sacrifice. Discipleship means following Jesus' death, following his teaching, following his resurrection, following his presence, and knowing that you have a Golgotha's heel. Don't look for fame in the world. Look for commitment in your life to Jesus Christ. People are fickle, and when you stop jumping as high as they want you to jump, they will turn their back on you in the flash of a hat. When you stop saying yes, 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 or you ask them to make a sacrifice, they will leave you high and dry. That's when the cheering stopped. That's when they walked away. When Jesus turned the tables upside down, interrupted their convenient uh, marketing, their convenient fundraising, their convenience, Jesus made them mad but they made Jesus mad by being so uh, uh, bent on having their way rather than remembering God has a way. And we as people of God must remember that God has his own method of being and doing right. And we need to seek God's method of being and doing right. Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Don't seek the comfort 
but sink, seek the road toward the cross. Nobody wants to walk on the road to the cross. Lord have mercy. I see my time is about up. I'm not going to be able to get through all of this, but you got my drift. Jesus says the time for miracles is over, but the time for commitment is now. Right now. Right now, decide you're going to commit your life to God and seek to live the way that Jesus lived by being faithful to the God who called you, being faithful to what he called you to do. And so then Jesus made one other thing that I've got to mention this morning. Jesus, uh, the cheering stopped for Jesus when Jesus suggested that all people are worth loving. That's what happened on Palm Sunday. He goes into the temple, throws the money changers out. After the temple is emptied, he then invites the lame, the poor, the sick, the outcasts of society to enter into the temple. He, he dares to bring into the church those whom we refer to today as those seedy street people. Why Jesus? That, that, that is not the way to win friends and influence people. You don't invite them folk to ours as church. You, 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 can't, you can't invite them seated people. Don't you know where they live? Don't you know what they're doing? We don't want them folk in our church. Some folk don't even want young folks in their church because young folks take commitment. You need commitment to deal with young folk. When you get in young folks life, you got to be committed because they're going to be looking for you to sustain your involvement more than just on a Sunday morning. They're going to need you to be involved in their lives and mentor them for the long haul until they become fruitful and productive young people for the Lord Jesus Christ. So here it is. I'm going to go down and end this to you. I want I want to really just tell this story, and then I think I'll be uh, finished for this morning. I got much more here, but I realize my 30 minutes are up. The more Jesus talked about the cross, the more the crowd stopped cheering. When people are depending on you and you start telling them that their dependence on you is coming to an end, they're going to stop cheering. They did not want to hear Jesus said he was going to a cross. They did not want to hear Jesus saying he was leaving them, not even for three days. They needed his miracles. They needed him to work for them. They could, they could not rationalize him talking about going to a cross because he's the Messiah who's come to restore the kingdom of Israel. How can you dare talk about you're going to die? We don't want to hear nothing about no three days you're going to rise. We want you to get rid of our oppressive systems that we're living in, and we want you to get rid of them now. It's like that song I, I listened to by Kirk Franklin, uh, We Need a Strong God. That's the kind of God the world is looking for. The world is asking, where is God? Why all these hurricanes? Why all these tornadoes? Why this COVID-19? Why cancer? Why all this suffering? We need a strong God. Why is God not doing miracles right now? Jesus is saying, this is not the time for miracles. This is a time for commitment. You've got to persevere. You've got to bear your cross. The old saints used to sing, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. Have we forgotten about the cross we have to bear? And we've forgotten that Jesus says, in this life, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Every sickness that comes to you is not going to leave. It's going to linger. And Jesus says, you got to have faith through it. You got to have faith through it. You got to keep telling your illness that your God is greater than any pain it could cause 
any procedure that you have to go through, any vaccination that you've got to submit yourselves to. Your God is greater than any government plot or conspiracy uh, theory against black folk. Listen, God has been keeping us from our earliest days up to this present moment. And no matter what the enemy has tried to do to us, God has kept us. I believe you ought to say amen right there. I believe you ought to thank God right there that down through the years, God's been good to us, but we had to bear the cross. We're celebrating Women's History Month and in February, we celebrated Black History Month. But listen, listen, our national anthem, the Black National Anthem says, stone of the road we, we trod, bit of the chastening rod, came in the day when hope unborn was lost. Listen, when we didn't have a hope that things would get better, we had a God that we depended on. We had a God that we knew could still change our circumstances. And the God we serve is calling us today to commitment, not just looking for a miracle, not looking for a handout, but girding up your loins with truth, having your feet shod with the gospel of the preparation of peace, having on the belt of truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and then take your shield of faith and stand where you are praying in all prayer and supplication through the spirit of God, deciding that I am committed to Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Come what may from day to day, I know, I know the Lord will make a way somehow. Just like the great hall of faith in Hebrews 11, some of us will die without receiving all the promises. But oh, when we stand, when we stand, let me tell you, we're getting ready to go in the Holy Week. I don't want to spoil it for next Sunday. But you ought to come be with us starting tomorrow night at 7 o'clock on this same platform. We're going to take you from Monday all the way to Friday. And we're going to leave you hanging on Friday so you can stay with Jesus in the grave because we know what's happening on next Sunday morning. Next Sunday morning, we're going to shout again. They stopped cheering on that Sunday when he entered Jerusalem because he would not perform miracles because he wanted them to be committed to him and not to what he could do for them. But oh, he wanted people who would walk the Via Della Rosa tore that old rugged cross with him and stay by his side. And they deserted him, even his disciples. Only a few women took the journey. I'm glad for women in the, in the gospel. I'm glad for strong women who stand by us and stand by our side, who say, I'm with you because a woman, I got your back. God made a woman a beautiful thing. They got your back. They'll stay with you. They stuck with Jesus until the end. And they were there early on next Sunday. We'll tell you about it next Sunday, but I want you to come go with us on this passing week, this coming week, beginning Monday night, every night uh, at 7 p.m. And then Friday at noon, we've got some lay people that are, there, that are going to do the, the seven last words. We got all lay people speaking. We're trying something new because all of us are ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You ought to come with us and hear these lay folk on Friday give these seven last words. This is going to be awesome. I feel the Holy Spirit is going to do a new thing in the Monroe District, and you ought to come be with us and be a part of this. Uh, free up some time and come on on this journey with us. Amen. Today, now you know when the cheering stopped. And you know why the cheering stopped. And the question is, has you, have you stopped cheering for Jesus? Have you allowed your faith 
to grow weary? Have you become a person who is like luster in your commitment? Or are you still on the battlefield? This word is for us today. This word is for you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for, for this word today. We ask that we would be committed, that we would not live our lives to receive the cheering of the crowd, but we will live our lives in anticipation of hearing you say, servant of God, well done. You've been faithful over a few things. Enter in into the joy of your Lord. God, we thank you for this word. We thank you for the hearers of this word. Bless now the fruit of your word in Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you today and God.